yeah. will not allow the computer to actually talk with the projector that we have today. So I can't show you the briefing, which is unfortunate because it's mostly videos and mostly demonstrations of how everything works. Uh, but what we'll talk about just briefly is what we do with the project, why we're doing it, and uh, some of the issues that we're facing out in the real world as we try to move away from airspeed and get civilian pilots used to flying angle of attack. And there's a really good reason for doing that. Um, the first thing I was going to say is this briefing is really directed at you guys, okay, because I'm part of what's called a non-sustainable demographic, all right? We don't need to save the 60-plus-year-old crowd, all right? But the interesting thing about mishap statistics is in the civilian world, loss of control mishap statistics are remarkably untouched by progress. Okay, we still kill people just as efficiently now in 2023 as we did in 1943 for the exact same reason. And it's mostly because about 120 years ago, the engineers made a really lousy decision to put an airspeed indicator in an airplane. Because all the airspeed indicator is, is a surrogate for angle of attack. And unfortunately, our eight brains aren't smart enough to take the square root of our G-load and multiply it by our indicated stall speed, correct it for density, altitude, and gross weight. If we could do that real time, then we'd be fine with just an airspeed indicator, right? But unfortunately, we can't do that real time. And stall spin mishaps are just something that the FAA has tried for the last 50 years by changing airman certification standards, programs, operational risk management. Everything we've thrown at this problem has had exactly 0.0, .0 impact at it. Okay, so the military ran into the same problem 50 years ago. And what the military decided to do was put angle of attack systems in every airplane and then change the way we teach primary flight instruction. So that from the very first lesson you flew in either a T-6 or a T-34 or a T-37, you used angle of attack. And you used it for every single sortie, which is a military word for flight. And it was just part of your normal habit pattern. Okay? And when you land an airplane, we land an airplane in a condition we call on speed. Now that's kind of confusing because it's an angle of attack, but we use the word speed associated with it. However, there is actually a speed associated with it. And that's what you guys are used to is your normal V app or V approach speed. So typically somewhere between 1.2 and 1.4 VS, depending on the airplane. Not only 1.3 if it's not specified anywhere else. And that's an on-speed condition. So the angle of attack associated with that condition is what you fly for approach and landing. But the neat thing about angle of attack is, unlike airspeed, it's not affected by gross weight or density altitude. So the on-speed condition in F-18 is always the same, whether it's bombed up or whether it's lightweight coming back aboard the boat. Same thing for a J-3, same thing for a 747, same thing for an RV-6. There's only one angle of attack that's optimum for approach and landing. And once you know what that angle of attack is, it's super simple to fly too, all right? So typically when we teach people to fly, we, we have gust additives, so we take VAP, we turn it into VREF, right? We already add five knots to it, and then we add maybe half of the headwind and all of the gust factor, and we come up with some god-awful speed that has you trying to land the airplane 15 knots too fast, okay? And it's really hard to land an airplane 15 knots too fast because if you try to do it, you can't. The physics won't allow you to do it. So what, what Cecil and I and some other folks did is we, we flew F-4s back in the day, which uh, was kind of the Harley Davidson of fighter planes, <laughs> all right? So it made a lot of noise, it went really fast, and it couldn't turn, kind of like a Harley Davidson. Um, and the problem with the airplane was above about 20 degrees angle of attack, it would just depart control flight, and you go for Mr. Toad's wild ride. So in a dogfight, it was very easy to depart the airplane from control flight. And it, nothing was consistent. I think my first one, I took 25,000 feet to recover. Okay? And we were just a couple thousand feet above the ground. So what they had to do is they had to give the pilot some tool to try to avoid that condition from happening. So they put what was probably the best angle of attack system ever built into an airplane. And they did it purely to mitigate loss of control mishaps with the F-4. And all we have done is re-engineered that system, and we've added some other features to it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand around a box. This is actually the system itself that computes angle of attack. It's completely independent of anything in the airplane, 
It's got its own IMU, which is an inertial measurement unit for us old guys, okay? Uh, and it's got a computer, it's got a Wi-Fi system, and then it has super accurate pressure sensors in it because what we do to compute angle of attack is we use something called coefficient of pressure, which is just a fancy way of saying we can compare two pressures. So this uh, was engineered by Tron. This we call the $10 dirt cheap angle of attack sensor. And this tube here you're all familiar with, that's a pitot tube. And then we just take an offset pressure. And if you think about it, as your angle of attack changes, those two pressures have to change, right? So that's all the computer is doing, is reading those two pressures and knowing how they change. And then it's computing angle of attack from that. And the other thing that the system does that's really important is it knows exactly where the flaps are in your airplane. So if you have flaps in your airplane, okay, if you guys remember from basic pilot training, that shifts your CL alpha curve, right? Coefficient of lift versus alpha shifts to the left when you put flaps down. You can tell that I have Armstrong flaps in my airplane because I just did the instinctive motion. But an angle of attack system has to know where the flaps are to have an accurate calibration. Uh, some of the commercial systems out there don't actually even have uh, flat position sensors in them. So when folks ask me, how do I calibrate that? I tell them, well, first, good luck. And second, um, do it in whatever your normal landing configuration is because the, the, the place you want your angle of attack system to work best is when you're in landing configuration. Um, so I'm gonna pass this around. This is actually an operational system. It doesn't have a, a top on it because I use it for demonstrations and then I use it for some uh, video stuff that we do. So I know you guys are all EAAers, so I would respectfully ask that you don't start taking it apart to figure out how it works. <laughs> uh, but you can, uh, you can take a gander at it. It weighs about 10 ounces in this configuration. Now this hardware, by the way, is a victim of COVID. We can no longer get the little central processing unit that's in here. So uh, we are in the process right now of re-engineering this to make it better and cheaper, we hope. Uh, but uh, anyway, that is what we're working on for next summer. So you can take a look at that. Okay? The heart of the system is actually a tone. Because when we fly, okay, it's really convenient to be able to listen to your angle of attack as opposed to read it. And there's a couple of reasons for that. The first best reason is you don't have to look at anything. What's that? There's a lot of little... <laughs> so my engineers will actually go, it's a super simple circuit design, and I go, yeah, right. <laughs> Where's the tubes? <laughs> well, how much does this cost? It costs $250 to build that box. Really? Yeah, so what we want to do is we, we want to engineer something that we can be produced for just a couple hundred dollars so it can be sold for, I don't know, maybe $500 mm -hmm. at the most, because who's cheaper than... Uh, like a, the RD crowd that I hang with, nobody. You know, there's there's a couple of really good commercial angle of attack systems out there, but that cost about $2,500, okay? And you'd be surprised how many folks are totally hesitant to spend $2,500 on something that's gonna probably save their life, all right? Oh wow, so we have a capabilities brief, huh? Yeah. We, don't, we don't have any videos in there, so I'm just talking about, we can, let's page through this. Let's go to the next one. Okay, uh, that's what we're doing. Next one, please. Thank you. Uh, our mission. Okay, so this is good. This is this is my secret lair. I'm down at Ruckel, okay, and the T hangar's down there. And uh, we have two instrumented airplanes. So uh, the folks up at Sky Park will occasionally see me beating up a pattern there where I'm doing some flight tests. They're gracious enough to let me use the east-west runway up there uh, because I can't do a lot of work in the restricted area uh, at low altitude. But anyway, this is my RV4. And uh, I've got an air data boom on here, so anybody that was back in the flight test world knows what that is. So it measures angle of attack and side slip angle very accurately. And that is something that we compare our system against. And then also inside the airplane itself, I have what's called a GNSS INS. So if you fly airliners like I do, you're familiar with that. That's the heart of a navigation system. It's a combination IMU or inertial measurement unit with GPS that talks to everything else. So there's actually two different GPS antennas on the airplane that are associated with that system. And it measures all of the angles, pitch, roll, and yaw within three hundredths of a degree. So it's a super accurate system, all right? And so what we do is when we fly, this little doohickey that I'm passing around records all of our data at 50 hertz, so that's 50 times a second. And then it integrates the data wirelessly from this boom 
and then buy a wire from that GNSS INS system, and it puts it all on the little SD card that's in the, inside the unit. So when I get done flying, all I have to do is establish a Wi-Fi connection with a box, which after watching my audiovisual buffoonery here, you would think would be amazing that I can actually establish a Wi-Fi connection. But I can, and then I can download all the data from the flight. So that's super helpful for the engineers. And we've got a couple of, uh, couple of different programs that we support with the instrumented airplanes. So we have two of them. We have my RV4 here, and then up in Michigan, we have Terry Lutz has an RV8, and his airplane has the exact same instrumentation configuration in it. So we have two test airplanes. And the real big difference between the two is that I have a fixed pitch propeller and Terry has a controllable propeller. And that makes a big difference aerodynamically. So we have to have both ends of the house that we can do our testing with. Let's take a look at the next one and see what's on there. Okay, this is actually the visual display. Even though we're all about audio, I succumbed to visual pressure a couple years ago and we developed a visual display. This is a modification of a standard military display. One of the problems with angle of attack right now is there is no set of standards, there's no TSO for how it has to work, okay? There's an ATSM standard, but it's, it's fairly broad. There's no requirements for accuracy or transient response. That, that's how well the system works in turbulence, okay? Um, and then there's no standard for displays. We like the military display because it's standard and it's really, really easy to use. And all it is is two chevrons and a donut. Okay, so when you're in a perfect approach condition, the donut's lit. It's that simple. And then if you're a little bit fast, the lower chevron's lit, and if you're a little bit slow, the upper chevron's lit. So the chevron that's lit tells you which direction to pull the nose to fix your angle of attack to establish an on-speed condition. It's about the simplest indicator there is. Bendix invented this way back in the early 1960s, all right? So we just modified it a little bit because uh, Lenny, who is our most creative guy, can pretty much do whatever we ask him to do. Um, and I asked him to put an LRD max Q on there. So I know when I'm in an LRD max condition, right? Because what, what happens at LRD max that's really important? The glide. glide. Yeah, best range yeah. glide, okay? It's also best rate of climb in angle of attack, all right? That occurs at LD max. Not precisely at LD Max, but close enough for government work in any light airplane that that's all you need for a cue. And then this is an on-speed cue. So other things happen at on-speed besides just an optimum approach condition. Okay, it's also maximum endurance glide. It's minimum power required. And what's so cool about an on-speed condition is if you're on speed, your thrust and your drag have to match each other for whatever your power is set at. Okay. So that's a really unique condition that we call zero piece of S when we get fancy, okay, or zero excess specific power. And what that means is if you're a little bit fast relative to that condition, you can always accelerate or you can go up, all right? But if you're slow relative to that condition, you can't. If you continue to pull the nose up, the airplane's gonna continue to slow down. And that's how people get into trouble, okay? The airplane's going to stall unless, unless you reduce your angle of attack or you add power or some combination of both. So it's a super simple system to use. You just know, am I on speed, am I fast, or am I slow? As a matter of fact, it's so intuitive that I don't have to teach you how to use it. I can show you a video of how it works, and at the end of this, uh, you guys can go to my YouTube channel. We work in a fishbowl. So all of the testing that we do, everything is up on there, and I have lots of training videos and everything else. So you can, you can go online and you can see how the system works, and I regret that I can't show you the video. Uh, also, we added a couple other features to this that uh, we didn't have in the military. We put a slip skid ball up there because, well, you can't spin unless there's yaw and a stall present at the same time, right? So we kind of thought, let's put that information right in front of the pilot. But because we don't want them to have to look at anything, what we do, is with the tone, we move it in your sound field with the ball, okay? Your brain, believe it or not, is remarkably adept at figuring out what direction sound comes from, assuming you have hearing in both ears, okay? So you can pick up within 10 or 20 degrees the direction the sound comes from. So all we do is just take stereo, and as the ball slides to the right like this, we just move the tone to the right. You can hear it move across your, basically you hear it moving inside your head, and you just step on the tone the same way you step on the ball to coordinate the airplane. So again, you don't have to look at anything. Uh, and because 
These two cues, G and indicated airspeed, are handy for uh, you know, aerobatic maneuvers when I'm going fast. We added those to the display. And then this number up in the top here is something called percent lift. And percent lift is, a, is a kind of a neat thing to know. And that's really just how hard the wing is working. Because angle of attack is the only thing that a wing sees. It's the only operational parameter that there is, all right? And at 100%, the wing is working as hard as it possibly can. And what happens at 100.0001%? It stalls, right? Okay. Percent lift for L and Max in every airplane ever built since the Wright Flyer occurs when the wing is working at 50% capacity. So if you have a percent lift display and it says 50, you are in an L and Max condition. If it says 60%, you are in an on-speed condition. So if you guys grew up like I did and flew old jets that had round dials in them, when you had the round dial in there for your uh, AOA display down in the instrument panel, that 0.6 condition was on-speed. And then sometimes the Navy got smart and they put all their dials so that on-speed was always at the 3 o'clock position. The Air Force was never quite that smart. Okay? Uh, but anyway, that's why we put uh, percent lift up here. And the other cool thing about that is that having a really good percent lift indication lets me ride the stall when I'm in slow flight to the point that I can differentiate between 98, 99% lift, and I can be perfectly comfortable within just a couple of knots of the stall, no matter what I'm doing with the airplane. Because if you guys, uh, how many RVers are in here? Yeah, so low G, we don't get any buff cues in the airplane at all. And the eight gets some because of your landing gear configuration, uh, but in the four and the six, uh, in the seven, there's like 0.0, .0 cues. The airplane just quits flying and tends to yaw off to the left when, when it stalls. The good news is it recovers like almost instantly. So if you do pooch it up and pull a little bit too hard, the airplane starts flying again right away. But having a cue like this makes it really, really easy for me to ride the stall, say, in the base turn, if I want to do that for whatever reason. So when you're on, on speed, the white bar will be in line with the two white dots. Ding, ding, ding. 50, That's, yep. 50 in between the red beam. Yep. So this, this is just the trend indicator that moves up and down. Because I, <coughs> I asked Lenny to add a trend indicator to it. It's just, it's handy to see everything moving. So what we did is we just combined a whole bunch of instruments in one simple little display. And I did that because it's also, if I'm an instructor and I'm in the back pit, it's exactly all the information I need to know what's going on up in the front cockpit. Okay, so we built it kind of for that. What suit we got on the next slide? Uh, that's just the box that we already passed around. You do have to connect it up, okay? So that's what the quick connects are on the back. So you'll connect one to your pedo, you connect one to this offset AOA pressure, and then because we're experimental, we'll connect one to the main static system in the airplane too. We can do that. If you have a certified airplane, you're not allowed to do that, okay? Next slide. Sure, absolutely, take a look. Uh, yeah, this is for the engineer, next slide. Uh, all right, the, the top one's really important. Uh, we, we had a great PhD, Dave Rogers, retired from the Naval Academy, Professor Emeritus up there that did all of our physics for us. And what Dave discovered was a really unique relationship uh, on how to, what the engineers call normalize coefficient of pressure for angle of attack. <coughs> the industry standard for years was to use static pressure from the static source of the airplane. But the problem is, is that static source typically comes from somewhere back on the fuselage and your angle of attack in your pedo is typically somewhere out on the wing, right? Mm -hmm. Well, those are two completely different flow fields, all right? And that's, that's really lousy physics, okay? So what Dave discovered is you don't even need that static source at all, okay? All you need are those two pressures that you're gonna get from a probe similar to that. And we're able to do that at two Gs or less Typically in the RV4, I see about a tenth of a degree error, somewhere between a tenth and two tenths of a degree. Okay, our spec is a half a degree, up to two Gs. And then up to about 4.4 Gs, we're at about three quarters of a degree, and at six Gs, I'm within about a degree, which is sufficient to capture an accelerated star. Okay, so um, we're the only folks out there doing this kind of testing, and we're the only folks out there that actually have a spec that we say that we meet for angle of attack. If you ask Garmin or ask Dynan what their specification is and how accurate it is, you're gonna get the Bufardi look, okay? Because it doesn't exist, all right? The other thing we do is um, we, we test at high Gs, but that's so when you're coming into the traffic pattern here and it's your typical sun, you know, summer afternoon and 
got a lot of cumulobumpies everywhere, you're experiencing some pretty significant instantaneous gust loads, right? Okay, and we measure gust loads in G's. So we just test at high G, okay, and we test at up to four G's per second. That's as fast as I can get the mighty RV4 to turn uh, by, uh, you know, basically pulling the stick back into my lap without over G in the airplane. And then we test up to six G's, which is the limit, okay? So when I do a six G stall, what speed am I stalling at? What speed am I stalling at? Six G's. Uh, that's that's the G know. limit of the airplane. Whatever your angle of attack, the critical thing, I don't know what speed. That's good, that's a good answer. But there's a magic number associated with that. What's the magic number? Maneuvering, Maneuvering speed. speed. Oh. oh, right? Maneuvering speed is the fastest speed you can stall the airplane at without over the airplane. Mm -hmm. So when I do a lot of these tests, I just go into a slice, and then when I stall at 6 Gs, I'm at about 132 indicated, all right, when the airplane stalls. And accelerated stalls for you guys that haven't done a lot of them, uh, it's real easy to tell when an airplane's in an accelerated stall because you're turning and all of a sudden the nose just stops moving. You just get a kum and the nose quits. And that's all an accelerated stall is. And typically you fly out of it right away as soon as you ease because um, there you go. Where people get into trouble is they, they experience that, they overshoot flying just a little bit, and then they're not paying attention to what their feet are doing, and then the next thing you know, they got a little bit of a skid input in, and if you have a skid input in in any airplane, it's always going to snap roll underneath, and it snap rolls about as fast as my hand just moved. Okay, and that catches people off guard at a couple hundred feet when they're on final. All right, because the only way to recover is to unload and roll really hard, uh, and so they don't, and then the airplane just snap rolls into the ground. This signal also has to be really usable by a pilot, so there's a lot of fancy filtering. We call Kalman filtering. There's a lot of digital analog conversion going on and everything else so that you as a pilot are just hearing a nice smooth tone going up and down. But the system is actually working at 50 hertz. And an AOA signal, one of the things that you might read about if you ever read about angle of, angle of attack is it's a noisy <coughs> signal. And noisy means that it's, it's doing this constantly. Okay, so what we got to do from an engineering perspective is we got to squash that down and we got to make that a nice smooth signal. The good news is, is in 2023, we have tremendous computing power and we can do that. We couldn't do that in 1972 like we can now. So it's very easy and that's all this is. It just means that on a day coming in here, we've got a lot of bumps in the atmosphere up to almost 128 feet per second in terms of a gust load. Okay, which by the way is way more than what your airplane is engineered for because your airplane's only engineered for a 50 foot per second gust load, right? So um, the system can keep up with all of that stuff and it makes it super easy to fly. Next slide. What do we got on here? We already talked about all these different cues. Okay, so we call this performance cueing angle of attack. So you can fly all of these different conditions using this system, all right? But again, we're the only system out there that is engineered to do this, as far as we know, okay? And it still gives you your standard old-fashioned progressive stall warning, and we do that just like what you guys are already used to uh, with your FAR 23 certified airplanes, okay? So we, we still give you the, the five knots or greater, 30 degrees, accelerated stall, 1.3 G per second, and rate just like you're used to, all right? So it's just a very easy to listen to tone and you can just hear it. And again, I'll give you my YouTube channel and you can go there. Next slide, please. Uh, we didn't invent this. this. This is a fancy picture of showing you something that if you just listen to it, takes two seconds to interpret, okay? Uh, but we'll talk about that when, actually, I can't talk about it because I'm, I'm not doing the beeps. I'm trying, I'm not gonna do the beeps. <laughs> All right. But this is that negative piece of S condition we talked about that the fighter guys understand means that you're on the back side of the power curve. All right. So even private pilots, remember you learned about your, your lift to drag ratio when we talk about to fly slower takes more power. You hear any slow tone at all, it takes more power to fly slower. It's that simple. Okay. Next slide. Uh, well, AOA tone demo. Let's see if it'll work. You got a speaker? Uh, the projector has a speaker. Okay, let's see what happens. Cool, it works. <laughs> <laughs> so as you slow down, hear the beep rate change? Yeah. 
That's an on speed condition. So now I know I'm on speed. So if you hear that all the way around the final turn, mm -hmm. you're safe. Yep. You never even have to look inside. Right. Slow tone, stall warning, stall. It's that simple. Okay? So like I said, you can teach yourself to use this in one landing pattern. So I get some comments sometimes about, oh my God, is that tone in your headset all the time? The answer is, yeah, it is. Okay? Only, obviously, when you're flying at an angle of attack higher than L or E max, so only when you're slow. All right? But the point is, is we worked really hard. This, this little computer in here has something called a, um, a MIDI interface. Okay, these guys know what a MIDI interface is. For the rest of us, that is hardware that handles music. Okay, that's the easiest way to think of it. So when we developed the different tone patterns, I have a grand piano, and I sat in the living room, and we got just two frequencies that we use. Uh, middle C, 400 hertz, okay? And that's an on-speed condition. So we got the tone pattern to match the piano, because the whole idea is when you're faster, you're on speed, that's kind of a happy place to be, right? So that is a happy sounding tone, all right? But if you're slow, we jump the frequency up to 1600 hertz, which is like a high D, and then all of a sudden it gets to be really annoying, all right? So um, what, what the ergonomics guys will tell you is that the, that the tone is readily internalized. And even with radio chatter, intercom, your wife in the airplane, God forbid, um, <laughs> the, the tone is just something that's kind of always there, and you, you process it. You process it in your lizard brain. What's really interesting is your brain, because, because hearing evolved before vision did. Um, your brain processes sound much faster than it processes vision. Did, okay, to process a visual signal, to read a display in the cockpit takes a second. It takes a half second for you to read it, and another half second to figure out what it's telling you. So we call that a half hertz cycle. All right. Well, a sound goes into your brain at like about a 10 hertz rate. So you, you just hear a lot better than you see, uh, believe it or not. Even though we're visual creatures, and the cool thing about flying is that we, we don't use sound for a lot of stuff, right? But think about how many times you've been flying and you get a little bit of water in your fuel, right? I mean, everybody instantly hears it when the engine goes, get to for a second. Right? Well, that, that's the way your brain works. And that's why using sound is so efficient for getting information in there. That, a, lot Sir. Of pilots, a lot of pilots have been doing this for a long yep. time, too. With yep. Varios. Yep. Variometer. Is it, it's exactly the same, same idea. Let's see what we got in here, too. I guess we got more demos. That might be cool. Uh-oh. We, we may have hit yet another audio-visual stop, but that's all right. Or a give that won't be done. That's okay. I think we got the crux of the whole thing <laughs> out. All right. That's because of your wife in the airplane joke. It is. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, you know, you, you are Bob absolutely respond. correct. Yeah. Yep, yep. And there's a bowl waiting for me at home. So, so again, when, when it's available for sale, <laughs> us RVers, uh, we're going to need to mount that. Pedo boom somewhere, I would imagine, leading edge of the wing. Uh, actually, believe it or not, below the wing, approximately cord. six inches below the wing, between 25 and 50% cord. That's some so of the magic that goes along the with the fish. Wash. Yes. Yeah, so I got mine on my left, my left wing. Okay. Uh, but it could be on the right wing as well. And then uh, automatically hooks up and engages with the EFIS. Or you're Great question. Independent of the you, if you have an EFIS and you want to record and you want to use the EFIS and you want all of your data in one place, yes, you can hook into your EFIS okay. and you can use your EFIS for calibration or you can calibrate it with the internal so IMG. Does uh, EFIS generally have an uh, input on the back or an input from the yes. box? Yes. It's a serial out on your EFIS okay. goes to the serial in on the box. And then the only other thing you need to do is install the if, if you want to have an indicator, you don't have to have it. You just have the tone. Yeah. yeah. So. And you think you guys can do all that for 500 bucks? We don't know yet. We're trying. We'll let you know. Van is totally on board. So uh, the good news is, is uh, 
the EAA is fully on board with this. So is the FAA, but the FAA is the FAA, so they'll, they'll never make any progress, right? <laughs> um, but the EAA is fully on board, so the Flight Safety Committee, the EAA, uh, Van sits on that, um, has put together an uh, AOA working group. So we have, a, we have a couple of working groups that we participate in. There's that working group. There's also a power loss on takeoff, so that's the testing I'm doing up at Sky Ranch now. That's for a cool little app called TLAR that basically knows where I am real time and goes, you are now at the magic altitude. If you lose your engine, you can turn back and you can land on the runway under ambient conditions, okay? Um, so, the, having, having a little bit of horsepower from the EA is great. What we did last summer uh, at Oshkosh is uh, there are angle of attacks indicators now in all of the simulators up there. So that folks that aren't, because we understand that angle of attack is still an alien concept for 90% of the non-military community. Um, and so a lot of what we're doing right now is just, oh, be aware of this, it's out there, it exists. Uh, I don't have a lot of good things to say about the commercial angle of attack systems, but that's because of the work that we do. Uh, but I would say that any angle of attack system that is properly calibrated is certainly better than no angle of attack system. And all of them, when properly calibrated, can be excellent progressive stall and warning indicators. You can't do all of this fancy stuff that we're talking about today, but it can help you if you overshoot final and you see that spike in AOA, just go, oh boy, I'm probably pulling just a little bit too hard right in here. I'm gonna make the landing out of this one. Yep, exactly. Well, go arounds are free, so. Is this gonna be? It's experimental now. Is mm -hmm. it going to be no seat for the? I, I don't know. What we what we really hope happens, sir, is that the because we're open source. Yeah. All right. Is we just hope that Garmin or Dynan or somebody actually notices what we do in all of our R and D and just takes our code and goes, "Wow, that's easy. We'll implement it." Okay. Uh, but because the civilian avionics companies just. They, they just don't have a lot of SA when it comes to this stuff, and I'm not sure why, okay? Uh, typically, they're being driven by their engineering department, and they, there's just not a lot of pilot input, and not everybody quite sees the value in a system like this. Everybody understands there's value in angle of attack, but they don't understand that we can use it for energy management. Um, and that's the piece that's missing in the civilian world, and that's what we're trying to do, and that's what you can do with this tone. That's why we have this little diagram. It, it's, this, we call this a push-pull diagram, because if you're on speed or you get any slow tone, well, you gotta push something, right? If you're a little bit fast, you gotta pull something. And so that's kind of how we teach it. And as as we, soon as they see the dollar signs, things will change. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, yeah, we hope. So this is that step that you talked about at the beginning of your of your talk to take us into the next generation of safety in the final term. Yep. That's where I for general aviation where yep. I fear. Absolutely. Kind of that's that's this this is gonna be for for the average folks with any airplane, it's gonna just be in the landing pattern where this is gonna be helping them out. If you're out there though and you're maneuvering really hard, if you're doing BFM or if you're uh, doing APRA or whatever. This is also great. Like the backside of a loop, you can nail the backside well, of a loop. Perfectly. It's a no-brainer for us yeah. XF4 guys, but yeah. I'll tell you, I've listened to many a, a tape, you know, where guys are in dogfight and you hear slow tone all over the place. Oh yeah, <laughs> there's there's nothing wrong with the slow tone. As a matter of fact, I was uh, I, I made a demo video yesterday. I haven't made it public, but uh, I flew one traffic pattern. I rolled off the perch and I just went right to 99% lift and I just rode the stall all the way around the turn. You can do it if you have enough SA uh, to do it. I've got other videos on there where I intentionally stalled the airplane 100 feet above the ground. So that's control condition, test pilot, know what I'm doing, right? Yeah. But the fact is I have a system in my airplane that gives me so much SA that I have the confidence to do that. So if you don't have the confidence to stall at 100 feet. That, but accurately. <laughs> yes. Accurately. Yep. And then the other thing I do is I fly the airplane with no airspeed indication in it at all. Because remember, 91205, we got a little exemption in the experimental world. If you have an experimental type certificate and it's day, VFR, the 91205 minimum equipment requirements do not apply to the airplane, okay? So it's a little far loophole. And it's great for flight tests. It's 
fantastic for that. So I have demonstrations where my, my PFD, my primary flight display, and my standby airspeed indicator are, are both covered up because I'm old enough that I can't fly off of all glass except at work when I'm getting paid. So uh, I have glass in the middle of my cockpit and it's surrounded by round dials and I feel very comfortable that way. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, so I fly the airplane regularly with no airspeed indication at all. And I get all the SA I need from the tone and the, uh, the indexer. So in the military we call that AOA display indexer. I don't know why, but that's what we do. Okay, and we're trying to bring all of the military terms over uh, there's been some discussion about that too because some of them are a little bit non-intuitive but my thinking on that is the wheels are already been invented it's been in successful use for half a century we don't need to reinvent the wheel we just need to take the yeah, technology see, and we don't need to be over. changing the pound sign to hash browns there you go it's all that part yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what else have we got in this brief any other videos that's simple yep so we talked about that um, oh here's a concept this, this one I kind of like to talk about a little bit because most, most, most of us live right around 1G in the flight envelope, right? We stay here all the time. Well, angle of attack, it's cool because remember your aerodynamic limit, that's, that's a parabola, right? It's not a straight line. So this is VREF, okay? This is your 1G stall warning. And then this is your best flight speed. So you can see the difference, right? So VREF in this airplane is gonna be right about here. Best glide speed is going to be right about here. Best rate of climb is going to be right about there. But as you go, as you start to put G on the airplane, look at what happens to everything. So at four Gs, okay, an on-speed condition is close to 150 as opposed to 75. So I do a lot of demos where I just put a lot of G on the airplane and you just watch the airspeed do that. What else have we got in here? Yep, that's too, too much discussion. I already talked about it. Oh, here's a maneuvering demo. Let's see if it works. I don't know. Okay, so here we are in a high G turn. Oh, a loop. So here I'm just catching an on speed condition on the back of a loop. This is an old primitive system, that's why the audio is so harsh. But notice I was on speed at 140. Okay, as opposed to final, where I'd be about 75 indicated for that condition. Thanks, Tron. I have no idea where you found this brief, but it's working. <laughs> the, video, the video's locked me up. But okay. Let's see, uh, oh, here we go, Sky Park, let's do this. Um, so part of the other work we do is the, uh, the power loss on takeoff working group, okay, and we've already developed uh, a set of procedures for flight instructors to teach this. We're working on a, uh, another chapter for the airplane flying handbook that's going to get into a lot more discussion on it. And the stuff that I'm testing right now is very cool. I'm just going to show you guys the app. Uh, it's called TLAR, which in the military means that looks about right, and it's written by uh, Jeff Brown, who is the C-130. Uh, squadron commander out at Nellis when I was on the Eagle side of the house out there. And it is an app, okay? And it is takeoff and landing data for your airplane. And it computes everything real time. It's got an aerodynamic model, it has an engine, and it has a propeller model in here. So for those of us that don't have pilots operating handbooks with a whole lot of data in them, this is a really nifty little app. And uh, the RV4 modeling, by the way, is going to be absolutely world class because Jeff is able to do everything with all the instrumented data, but he's got models for RV-10, he's got models for RV-7, uh, he's got a Cirrus and some other airplanes in here, there's some Cherokees in here. Um, this is available in the Apple App Store, the commercial version of it, and there's a free version, so try it out, okay? And if you want to go to the really, really expensive version, it's a buck a month, I think. I don't know, so plug for Jeff, but what we're doing now is What's we're testing, the again, the it's called TLAR, that looks about right, T-L-A-R, T-L-A-R, yeah, that looks about right, and it's in the Apple App Store, but this is what we're working on right now, and uh, notice it knows I'm already at Crestview, and it already pulled up the ASOS data for Crestview, okay, and it knows when I start a takeoff roll, and what it's going to do is it's actually going to compute, if I go into the emergency mode, a predicted minimum turnback altitude, which it tells me today is uh, 936 feet, uh, which is actually high because Jeff is working on the model. Um, but this is up at Sky Park, 
okay? And this was the original testing that we did uh, for the program um, over the last couple of years. And um, anyway, all I'm gonna do is take off on runway nine. Now, this is 250 feet AGL, and I will be honest, uh, we didn't know at this point how much residual thrust I was getting for my prop. It turns out it was a lot. Okay, so really the minimum altitude I can do this from is 350 feet AGL, no wind. And the reason I'm able to do that in an RV is because RVs are great climbing little airplanes. Okay, Cherokee 6, what do you think? Cherokee 6, you can't even turn back. Okay, I mean, it's just not an option because your, your climb to glide ratio is wrong. Okay. Uh, you have to be able to climb steeper than you glide, otherwise the physics are against you. So this turn back maneuver is kind of the ultimate it depends emergency procedure. So many things impact this. The ambient conditions, the wind, the airplane that you're flying. But this is just something I did originally because it was a cool little AOA demo. So we'll take a look at this. Because by using AOA, it becomes cosmically simple to do this. So I'm climbing out now to VY condition. So there's that on-speed condition that's just absolutely magic when you fly an airplane. Mm -hmm. great example of the tactical utility. Now something else, if you land an airplane on speed, actually in the slow tunnel like this, can it bounce? Yes or no? It's a physics question. No, well, because the landing gear is bringing us to it, yes. Eh, it depends. The point well, is... You do it with lift. Yeah. You said on speed? Yeah, well on speed, it's you're carrying a little extra energy, but once you actually get into the slow tone and you know you're on the stall, that airplane just sits on the ground, okay? I mean, you may get a little bit of motion from your landing gear, but the wing is, is done working for the day. So that airplane is gonna stay on the ground. Most of us, when we make a transition from flying airspeed to, to flying angle of attack, you're gonna go, oh my God, this is slow. This is way too slow. No, you've just been flying way too fast too long. <laughs> And you know we tend to add five knots for mom. We tend to add five knots for whatever. And there you go. And it, and I do. I occasionally I do some instruction in RVs to check people out, friends and family only. Um, and it's funny because when there's not an AOA indicator in the airplane, I watch everybody do the RV bunny hop because you're carrying too much energy into the landing. So the airplane does this little bunny hop down the runway, and it's just because you're trying to land too fast. But with an AOA system, that's really hard to do because you know exactly where you are relative to the, the energy state of the airplane. So that is as simple as we can make energy management and as simple as we can make land in an airplane. And then something else too that the Air Force is wrong about is how we teach people to do that. Because if you have a really good angle of attack system, all you have to do is control the angle of attack with your stick or your yoke, the glide path with your power, and then the ground track with your bank. And that's all it takes to land an airplane. When will this be available? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Uh, well, because you're I, getting us excited now. I, I know, but I you know. can't tell us when we're gonna. When I know. We get our I know. Out. It's it's sad because we're we're a we're a group of all volunteers and everybody and we got and some of the rabbits go off and work on different <laughs> projects and then we try to gather everybody back in and then we we make significant progress and then we wait. Uh, but right now, what we're doing is. This hardware all works. Uh, the problem is, is we can't build it because we can't get the parts for this particular thing. What, what they engineered this for is, believe it or not, as complicated as this looks, it's for guys like trying to actually build at home, okay? So this is a home-built piece of hardware. Um, heat kit. Yeah, heat kit, exactly. But uh, the, the, new system will be, um, the new system will be something that is just built. 
it uses what uh, engineers call surface mount technology. So the chips and stuff are just kind of welded right onto the motherboard. Um, What's the performance of that compared to a Raspberry Pi? Uh, it's pretty comparable, but I don't know. I'm not that. I'm, now you're getting down to the weeds questions uh, with the T. This is a TC 3.6. Um, I do know that we can't do our our Kalman filtering that we want to do with the new system on here because we crushed the CPU. Um, so we're going to go to an ESP32 engine on the new system because they're cheap, inexpensive, and they work. And they're readily available. So if brand A doesn't work or whatever, we can go to brand B. Uh, and this is also written um, for you guys that are hobbyists. This is written in what's called the Arduino uh, development system. So that's what the kids use to build robots and stuff in high school. Very cool. All right. Very uh, user friendly and adaptable, but also just a complete pain in the butt to use. So the new system will, will transition to some sort of its own software. I don't know how we're going to compile it. But when you go to update it, it's just going to be a matter of turn it on, it finds a signal, and it updates itself. So, um, yeah. We have a hardware design for the new system, but it actually takes a few more components than what this does because the newer versions of the Arduino uh, don't have as many separate functionality on the single chip. And so like the audio, which is a big part of what we do, requires a separate chip while it is built into this original art arena. Mm -hmm. So do you see selling it as a kit in some assembly of the No, we're, we want it to be engineered. Van's going to, if, if we can get this damn thing built, Van will sell it to the catalog, at least for the oh, RV yeah. crowd. Um, and the nice thing about that, too, is that we can probably put um, some pretty good calibrations in the system so yeah. people, you don't even necessarily have to do it. One, one thing also that we found out early on, and I, I think we talked about this last time, is when we very first started this project, like eight years ago now, I think it's been, we built 10 systems and we gave them to 10 pilots with instructions. And they all had Dynan in their airplane at the time. And I gave them the Dynan AOA calibration instructions. And out of 10 pilots, how many people do you think calibrated their Dynan AOA system correctly? Really close. We have one guy get really lucky, uh, but even our experimental test pilot couldn't calibrate the system properly. Okay, so one of the problems with all these commercial systems out there is they're only as good as the calibration. So what uh, Lenny did was take Dave Rogers' physics and completely automate it. So what our code does that is really neat is when it's time to calibrate, all I do is I accelerate down. To V max, that's as fast as the airplane will go, right? And then I pull the power back and I let the airplane decelerate and stall. And the system calibrates itself from that. And you just do that in each flap setting. And now you have an accurate AOA calibration for each flap setting. And then it actually even computes the different angles for L over D max on speed and stall. But what about installation hmm? accuracy? So, I mean, you need to have that horizontal tube, yes. not the angled one, but the horizontal has to be in the slipstream. Mm -hmm. What's your pitot tube? You can use a Dynan pitot tube, you can use a Garmin pitot tube with this. Yeah, matter fact, my pitot tube is right the center of the prop, and I don't... Oh, you have an RV-12? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, it's interesting you mention that, because we're putting one on Bob's RV-12, but I gave him a Dynan pitot tube, so he's going to slap a Dynan pitot tube out on the wing, and we're going to see how that works. Uh, one of our other, uh, uh, Jeff Vaughn has got an RV-12 flying with our very first generation system in it, and it works. Okay, so he's got the pop rivet out on the wing, and he's got the pitot tube up here. Absolutely not ideal, uh, and it's our first generation system that's just reading the 9% <laughs> But we signal. But I helped him calibrate it up at Oshkosh, and so he's got a good flyable signal for approach and landing. I imagine that needs to be clamped onto a rib, right, to give it some rigidity. What, that, that box? Yeah. You can't. Oh, this goes in the cockpit. Not the box, the yeah. pedo boom. Oh, the pedo boom. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, once it's he gets a bracket on. And then holds that to a, a rib. And then he's taking No, that actually just goes into a doubler plate or the skin itself. Right. That one. Yeah, doubler plate's what we recommend. And yeah. It's the same. <laughs> There's actually uh, aircraft spruce sells these with the bottom tube being a static port. 
and we remanufactured basically the design with the bottom tube being the offset. But there is a design criteria that comes with this, and it's, I think it's if you look at uh, aircraft spruce, they'll have a little diagram. So if you buy their basic uh, El Tipo pitot tube like this, it'll show you how to build a dub or a backer plate for it. Mm -hmm. That's you what I have where your ring, ring my light. Where that ring is would be the sur bottom surface of the yes. ring. Yes, yeah. that is correct. And then you got to run mm -hmm. two pressure lines from there all the way back to the yeah. device. Mm -hmm. But when, when, when Bayerman, who is the world's slowest human being, gets around actually putting it on his RV-12, just come on down and take a look. Yeah. Uh, because what we're going to do is we're going to put uh, quick release fittings on the end of the I live about 300 feet from your hangar. Oh, perfect. I'm on Stephen Drive. Oh, well then, come on out. Come on out, because there's always beer in the fridge. You know, anybody who buys a Dynon system, they get a Dynon pitot tube that comes with the uh, AOA uh, probe as part of that pitot tube, and in the airplane, uh, you just plumb it like you would with Dynon or Garmin, but you just put a T connection. Yep. One tube goes into your Dynon sensor, and the other tube goes into our AOA box. And the same with the Garmin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in my airplane, it, I, what I've done is I can fly two probes at once. So on my uh, on my left wing, on my uh, aileron inspection plate, I have a whole other system. So I have two AOA systems in my airplane, and I, that way I can I fly two tubes in the exact same flow pattern. And right now I'm flying a Dynan and a Garmin tube. Both of them, by the way, are really really good tubes. Is it your aileron inspection yeah. port is further aft though. It's 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 far enough out that I'm at 26 percent okay. cord, so it works out okay. Um, and both of those tubes are I, I highly recommend both those tubes. They're both really well designed. The Dynan is a little bit better at, at super high angle of attack because it's got more of a Russian nose on it. Uh, the the Garmin is spherical, but it's got enough of an offset in the pitot that it, it still does well at high alpha, just not quite as well as the Dynan. And truth in advertising, too, you'll, you'll see this in some of my videos, uh, all of these pressure systems have trouble with side slip, okay? Yeah. So if you put a lot of side slip on the airplane, you think about it, right, you, you're canting this too. You get, I remember most of you guys, I'm sure, are flight instructors, and remember how you teach people to do slip, and you go, now watch what happens to your indicated airspeed as soon as we put a slip on the airplane, right? Because you're changing your pitot and your static pressure, and you see the airspeed indicator move, right? <coughs> typically it, it'll either go up or go down, depending on whether you're going left or right. Uh, so these systems, Dave Rogers tested them in a wind tunnel, and we're good up to about five degrees of side slip. So we actually generate more than five degrees of side slip if you put a really hard slip in to come and land. So there's gonna be some error in the system in a big slip, and that is just simply physics. Now what we're trying to do to work around that is build this fancy spherical probe because it turns out if you, if you take a if you take a, a, a spherical shape and you make it big enough, okay, you might mitigate some of the side slip issues. We just don't know yet because um, the hard thing is is if we had five pressure sensors that would be cake to do. But the problem is is you can't have five pressure sensors in something that only costs 500 bucks right. because the pressure sensors are too expensive. Plus, then you got to run five lines to the cockpit too. So we're trying to see if we can stick with two lines, but the jury's out on whether or not we can get there or not. What if you just made the probe weather vane? What's that? What if you just made your probe weather vane? I suppose that would be theoretically possible. Or like the headlights on all the new cars. Uh, yeah. That when you turn <laughs> the headlights on. Well, yeah, <laughs> but if you just put a tail on it and let it swivel, It'll always line up with the uh, with the relevant air. That yeah, sounds conceptually possible. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Save you five probes. Yeah. It'll put a damp dampener on it so it doesn't. Yeah. Well, the, the sad news is is that the engineers did a whole bunch of computational fluid dynamics and they thought they had a great design and then I flew it once and I go, no, not a great design. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we still do flight tests. Yep. So so that. Obviously, there's, there's two ways to measure the AOA, and that's with a different set of an air pressure like you do there. The other is the old-fashioned wedge in the airstream. Yeah, a vein, right. Is, is that too expensive that way? Is that no, the, like? veins work great on jets, uh, although there's a better way to do it on jets. The cone with the two slots is a lot more efficient than a vein, okay? Um, 
But the real issue with the vane on little airplanes is where you're gonna put it underneath the wing. It's, it's gonna get broken at some point. That's, that's the real issue with it. Um, but there's some folks out there that are actually using vanes with our system because I'm always flabbergasted by how many people can go to, a, it's called GitHub, that's where everybody shares all their software and the hardware designs for open source stuff. And you know, there's, there's like dozens of people out there that have built these things. And they've just ordered parts and they've just made them. And you know, for a guy like me, that's like, holy cow, that's damn near impossible to do something. But there are a surprisingly large number of, of folks out there that are electronic hobbyists that build this kind of stuff. See, so are you going to find your new airplane for this? Hmm? Are you going to put this on your new plane? For this? It's already in there. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, oh, yeah. First instrument. And I got four pedo, I mean, four static ports on the airplane because it has a, a kind of a static issue of trying to find the perfect. So I, I already have four static ports to start playing with it once I. I yeah, get it going. Dial the cockpit static port A, B, C. Yeah, but one, one, one of the things uh, back you talked about calibration, but actually the calibration starts off with your iPhone. You take your iPhone, there's a web page inside this box, a Wi Fi connection. So you log in with your iPhone into the web page that shows up off this box, and then uh, you go to the calibration function, and it is like back started. Uh, you push the power forward and then you hit start on your iPhone and you go through the whole procedure and once you stall the system figures out where the stall is and it'll stop the data collection and then it creates the curve for you and it will if you accept it it'll go direct into your configuration file and all that gives you your quarter to have to read mm -hmm. yeah accuracy yeah exactly and then and same thing too, when you put it in the airplane, you know, we, uh, we have automated sensor calibration. So you just have to slap the box in the airplane and then uh, you measure your pitch and your roll. You just put an electronic level on your fuselage reference line, which in an RV is always a canopy boat, so super simple to do. And then uh, dial an altimeter to 2992. You put your pitch and roll and your pressure altitude in there. And then now the box finds itself in space. You know, no matter how you have it mounted, it goes, okay, this is how I'm mounted. Now the IMU knows where it is, and everything works after that. So on that little visual display, there's a lot of things in here I didn't talk about. Besides angle of attack, there's an overload warning system like we had in the F-15 in here. So it knows your Gs, all right? And it knows when you're rolling, and it knows when it's a straight pull. The fighter guys in here know the difference. That's called a symmetric versus an asymmetric pull. A lot of folks don't realize this, but what's the G limit on your Bonanza? 4.4? 4.4, but it's not if the airplane's rolling. What is if the airplane is rolling? Oh, I don't know. It's, it's reduced by 33%. Okay, so if, if anytime we say a G load is symmetric, it's just we maneuver the airplane in a single axis, which is also the way your maneuvering speed is defined. A lot of oh, folks I don't see. understand that. If you're like pulling that. like this. Right, if you're pulling and rolling, yeah. you don't have a 4.4 G airplane in that You have about a 3.5, 3.8 G airplane at that point. But that's because the aircraft is actually pulling about 4.4, right? Well, that's because one wing is, but the other wing isn't. Right. Right, so it's an asymmetric condition. So this system just knows, all right? Because as a pilot, we don't care, right? Do we care? We don't care. We just want to know we're in a limit. So that's it. So how about power requirements? Uh, just 12 volt. So one lead is going to be your three uh, uh, pressure lines coming in. Mm -hmm. You need 12 volt and there's and, a, and then how about the cannon plug or connector from there to the display? So, yes, there's a little four wire line that comes out if you have that display. And in that display, too, um, oh, and there's an airspeed warning in here, too. So, it, this basically lets you listen to your entire flight envelope uh, in addition to just the AOA. Um, and then, because some of our engineers are really good, I just put things out my way. So on the little display, there's also an uh, there's also an ADI attitude director indicator. Okay, uh, there is just a, a plain old AOA indexer that doesn't have uh, all the fancy stuff on it in case you just want a plain indexer. Uh, there's also uh, some flight test stuff that we put in there. So I know precisely what my deceleration rate is. Okay, I have a little meter that tells me that. And then uh, for wind up turns, which is well, uh, that's a flight test expression for nominal just sustain a 3G condition. Okay, uh, I've got a historic G display. So instead of just reading my G's, 
I basically have a graphic historical G display, and I can tell when I'm pushing it up. It's a little bit full. Because right. when you boot it up, it comes up with the AOA display, the yep. default that you see up on the screen. Yeah, and you just you just cycle through the different displays. Then you can cycle through different displays, yeah. and then you can adjust how, the. How large is that display? Yeah. Oh, I got one right here. It's small. We use we use this. This is a little. Um, Commercial product, the front thing of this is a commercial product. Okay, the back part of it though, we built. It's custom built. There's power supply in here, and then the back shell we built uh, ourselves. Um, but this is this is called an M5, and it's dirt cheap. What are they, like 30 bucks a piece or something? Yeah, they're about $45. A 45 piece. So it's the cheapest we could do it, okay? The problem is, is it's not super sunlight readable. So you saw in the video, I have a little black hood over the top of mine, and the hood makes the display readable. Um, we just, some folks have 3D printers, and we just print out a 3D hood, and uh, the yeah. color of your choice, I, I like black. <laughs> yeah, like, like the back shell and everything, all, all of this stuff is all 3D printing, because that's just cheap, cheap and easy. So. Um, what airplane do you have it in? I have it in my RV8, and I'm installing it in my sling that I'm building. So you got it in the eight and you got it in four. Four, yep. Yeah. I'm in the process of, of taking the data output and my heads up display has an AOA indication inside of there. So I'll just feed the AOA uh, uh, angle of attack data into my heads up display computer and that way it'll all just be a single thing on my cool. heads up display. But uh, you know, the little box is really good and you can adjust the brightness of it with the outside. There's three buttons on here. The center button changes the functionality and the outside buttons increase or decrease how bright the, uh, wow. the little box is. Cool. So it's about as simple yeah. as you can imagine and but, you know, it's an awesome functionality in the software that we put together. Yeah. But you don't never have to have it. that. You can no. just just have the audio. Just, just have the audio thing you really need, right? Yep. Yeah. 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 I, I actually push really hard at not having a visual display, uh, but but some people are going to want it. Some people are going to want it. Go. So I succumbed, and then um, then it turned into a contest to go. Okay, if if we're going to adapt a standard, well then what should the standard look like? So that's why. The, so this has a this has a political function too. <laughs> first gets to set the standard. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the visual display kind of goes back through our, our progression through the EAA innovation contest. Because, you know, the, the first two years, I think 2016 and 2017, you know, we, before this ever started, VAC came over and said, what can we do? And, I, and so we started talking about it and we came up with, what if, EA, AOA and then says how can we do that so we brought my son into it and we built the, the first one which basically was a tone generator that looked at the data coming off of a Dynon AOA output and then we massaged the, uh, the tone so that it fit properly into what the airplane was actually doing not necessarily that it mimicked what was going on internally in the Dynon the Dynon was just spitting out the data but when uh, we submitted our proposals the first two years and not a peep out of EAA, and then the third year, I guess in 2018, you know, like 30 days before Oshkosh, Zach got a phone call and said, hey, you're a finalist, one of the five finalists. So you can just hear our jaws dropping on the, on the ground when they said that. Really? Okay. So when we went off and we gave our presentation, you know, the actually Vans wasn't that hot on, on our system, but the other guys there who had military background, they said, this is awesome. But we didn't have a visual display, and some of the feedback that we got out of the folks there from EAA was, well, you know, you should really have a visual indication, and you need to be able to play with the tone so you can adjust it and what all, and that's how we wound up with our final design. Because the functionality, you really, I guess, didn't talk about the little button or the our box, yeah. our volume knob and everything. But we have a single control on the panel. You turn it left and right. Quieter, louder. Quieter, left and right. louder. Inside this, this little magic button, it has an LED that 
flashes. And so we drill a hole through the knob, put a little drop of clear epoxy on it, so when we stick it on the shaft, you can see a flashing LED inside of there, and that's our heartbeat. That tells you that the system is working, and it has a slow flash, slow LED flash to it. And if you press the button in, it'll turn the audio off, and it'll tell you that it's off. There's a little lady's voice that comes in and said, on speed off, or something like that. Disable? Yeah, disable. On speed enable. And if you press the button down and hold it, it'll put a data mark into, it's always recording data. Whether you use the data or not, it's recording everything that you do. And it'll put a data mark into the data stream. So if you're using it for some type of a, a test or whatever, you can go back in and find that point again. I can't remember it. In the F4, we can turn the volume down, right? But I didn't, did we turn it all the way off? No, you just turn it down and up. And so we just, for Lenny, enable that feature and it just the computer continues to run uh, but he's an engineer so I, I said hey volume knob's good enough he goes oh no we'll do volume knob and then we'll do quick push and want to push I'm like okay so we did the, the indicator mm -hmm. still works yep but the uh, you won't hear the volume out of it yeah that's it's well, really I remember the first time you told me about this mm -hmm. and you said oral tone and then you played that that first demo what three four years ago mm -hmm. and all the four guys said you know that's a no-brainer. Why, why have we not had this in light airplanes <laughs> yeah. from the beginning of time? Where, and here's, you know what, F-15. The problem was that Eagle had such good buffet cues that we we didn't even add an AOA tone to the Eagle until right before I retired, and I retired in 2009. Um, and we only put a pilot selectable tone in there when we went with 35 units, because that was about the same as 25 in the F-4. Uh, but the, the point is, is that airplane you could maintain corners about 350. You could be plus or minus five knots in that airplane just based on the wind noise and the buffet cue. So it was so caveman simple to fly because it gave such good aerodynamic cues. There was never a need to, to reuse the F4 system. So it just kind of fell out of favor. And then now all, all the airplanes that we fly now in the military have automatic flight controls. And that's kind of similar to the airline too, right? I mean, the 777 I fly at work won't let me overbank it. It's just gonna go, dude, just stop. Yeah, I'll, you know? work great. I'll work great until 737 max. Yeah. So, um, so now in a fighter, you know, you're just a voting member as a pilot. So you just pull on the stick, and the airplane knows what the angle of attack and everything else is. And it goes, oh, if he just wants to turn really hard to the right, I'll turn really hard to the right. It's not going to, Hal isn't going to let you stall. So, um, there you go. So this is built for an airplane that has manual flight. You know, and eventually I think we're going to see improvements too in the civilian world. Even, even the true track system I have in my RV4 has an auto recovery mode, right? Well, you're going to see better and better integration. NASA's already working on it. Um, where it'll be something very similar to what they have in the F-16. By the way, we got 14 lives and 13 airframes saved in the F-16 so far. Fully automatic recovery, okay? Because the guys were G-locked, they didn't know what was going on. Airplane's hurtling at the ground and the airplane goes, hmm. Ground's right there, I'm here, nobody's making any input, I'm going to do this, and it recovers. Okay. So eventually I think what we'll start to see, even in general aviation, because the, because the electronics are getting so good, is if you have any sort of autopilot system, and the, the Garmin's already got this in like the, uh, the big Pilatus and the, the single engine turbines, okay, the airplane just isn't going to let you do anything that is going to get you into trouble. It's just going to go, no, stop dude, I got it. No, that is until we figure out that the engineer that designed that forgot one particular set of logic. That well, that's those are the undocumented features. That's what us test guys do. We find the undocumented remember features. Remember the Airbus that, that <laughs> yep. flew into the trees and yeah. air shield position. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. They'd never flown low with the gear down and an the uh, thrust selector levers. Mm -hmm. And uh, the computer said, well, no, you're in landing configuration. I'm not going to. You pilot may have pushed the throttle forward, but I'm trying to land, mm -hmm. and it flew right into the tree. I participated in a test we did here um, years ago to, to put a, a visual horizontal display. There was actual projector. We, we did it, unfortunately, on the F-16, and the device that generated the artificial horizon sat right over here, so the arm had to be underneath it you know, to get on the side stick controller. So we only did it in the B model. 
uh, or demodel because you know, they knew the guy's going to have to have time to eject. He's going to have to get his arm out of the way or he's going to leave his arm behind. And my understanding was we inherited that, or at least the basic first design from the SR-71 that had a horizontal laser-generated horizon because AOA is super critical in the SR. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're on condition at Mach 3, if you raise your AOA just a sliced amount, uh, you can go out of control, and if you slow down, you can unstart the engines. And uh, so we took that system and tried to modify it. And, you know, trying to do that kind of testing, you need to be uh, no horizon. So we had to go out over the Gulf of Mexico 100 miles or more, and now we're in a condition where you know, we're trying to violate back when we used to call it 60-16, because mm -hmm. we're exceeding six degrees of pitch and uh, 90 degrees of roll. And, uh, but they pretty much rejected that. All the pilots said, I said, well, it's nuts. That's not right. And the idea was that if you're, you know, in some kind of BFM condition or ACT or whatever, you'll always have your peripheral vision, you'll have a horizon mm -hmm. uh, false, you know, generated and moved by the computer. But I think now with the uh, takes care of all, all that, that stuff. it's all yeah. water over the bridge. Yeah, I tested that. That the, 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 the amount of SA you have and everything is in your visor is just yeah. phenomenal. Yeah, at Oshkosh this summer there was a company out of California that has a sling four like I have, and they're putting a complete fly by, fly by wire system in that airplane. Wow. And so they're, they had an airplane there to demo. They haven't flown it yet, but it will have double or redundant two computers flying with a uh, uh, servo actuated flight controls for all the axis of the airplane. So they only did uh, double redundancy? Yeah. They only had at least the what design as they gave it to me this summer was double redundancy. How do they resolve the... Uh, How do they resolve the conflict? Uh, Double's better than single, though. That's the way they look at it in GA. Well, Eventually, F-16 is four. Quadruple. Yeah. Well, it could, it could be so that they have a third change. that just looking at where the horizon is and all of that, and it would give a vote if, if one of the two other computers is, is sees the world differently than what it should. What, what, we do in the, what we do in the airline world with double redundancy is you just get a disag. Okay, so you as a pilot, you just got to figure out what's going on. Okay, and I'll get it, maybe get a disag, and I'll get one other warning going. My my right doohickey has failed. Go okay, I got to use my left doohickey now. We're going to actually do the same thing with the next generation box because when we can get to advanced Kalman filtering, we should be able to have an all attitude IMU drive AOA. Because if you stop to think about it, all angle of attack is it's just the difference between where you're pointing and where you're going. That's it. So it's the difference between your your whiskey line or where the airplane is pointing and your flight path vector where the airplane is going. So an inertial measurement unit knows the flight path vector of the airplane and it also knows where the airplane's pointing. So it can compute angle of attack that way as well. As a matter of fact, uh, anybody in here have an Aspen EFIS in their airplane? We got one in our Cherokee 6 and uh, Aspen EFIS uses an IMU drive. AOA. It's not very good, it's pretty primitive, but it, it's in there. So conceptually that works. So what we're going to do with the new system is we're going to have INU AOA, we're going to have pressure AOA, and if they ever get out of whack, you're just going to get a disag one. I, Sir? Do I really need this on my uh, rocket champ? <laughs> well, it's funny because I, I start my brief off with a guy killing himself in a 140 in front of his wife. So I would say, yeah. But also, I know your experience, Charlie, and your butt is very well calibrated. And that's all, <laughs> that's all Wolfgang was getting at in the first 76 pages of Fly the, you know, Fly the Wing. Um, he's just talking about angle of attack because, um, and it's, it's in the brief and I regret that I can't use my own computer and I will fix that for next time. But what's interesting about angle of attack is angle of attack and pitch are sometimes related, but most of the time not. But angle of attack and G-load are always married up. Always, always, always. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you go into a turn or you put any G on an airplane, your AOA goes right now with that. They're insane. Unfortunately, I don't think most uh, people see the pants or quarter or half degree accuracy. Well, but that, but the point is, yours are, or it's pretty. I bet it's pretty damn close. 
Because based on experience and aerodynamic cues of the airplane, you can you can get that level of performance out of it. And that's what that's what he was trying to describe in the first 76 pages of that book. But the problem is, is that takes training and that takes a lot of experience. We're just trying to make it all out of matter. But yeah, so that, um, that video is actually a, uh, it was an AOA stall competition, I think last year. And it's, it's really sad because the guy is just trying to build some space behind the airplane in front of him. So instead of going around, he starts to S turn and he just gets slow and the airplane just rolls right in the ground and he kills himself in front of his wife and kid. So, and you would think a guy that was flying in a stall competition would have that well calibrated, but apparently, but apparently he didn't. I was coming into Tyndall, 1982, we were training to replace the f 101s that did dark toe for the F-15s. And William Tell, that mm -hmm. October, was getting fleshed out. And they said, if we lose the 101s, who's gonna pull a dart for the competition? And I said, well, those Moody F-4Es, just up the coast there, or the, the Air Force Base, they, they come down here all the time and pull their own dart. Why don't we ask them? So I went down and they used the LCTT, which is a 17 inch aluminum tube, um, 18 feet long, had plywood fins, but it had an acoustic score system in it, like you have behind the berm on a mm -hmm. ground range or straight. And we had an RMK, a Marquette RMK 19 real machine, which there's one sitting on the F-4 in the uh, outside air park there at Edwards. Uh, weighed 6,500 pounds. Had two six-bladed propellers <coughs> that could be uh, the AOA or the pitch change to cap spin in, or roll the, the cable in, or roll the cable out. <coughs> and this is the part that a lot of people often try to catch me on because they think I made a mistake. We could hold 42,000 feet of cable, not 4,200. And we can put the dart out, we put out 2,000 feet, and we go in, the, the ROE for uh, William Tell was we would pass 3,000 feet, uh, side to side, 3,000 foot altitude, shoot her dart toe, and we would turn into it. And then it was whoever could get the first hit, it was done by time. And then we, all, we kept track of the number of hits to break a tie. Coming back with that machine, typical thunderstorm, short final on Tyndall Runway, I was checking out a guy, I put him in the lead to land him first with this arm, arm K-19 on the belly, and I uh, pulled the throttle back to drag, try and get enough space for us both to land. But thunderstorm on final, I had to delay that maneuver until I was about three miles from the end of the runway. So I'm back there, you know, Yawing left, yawing right, drop the speed brakes, and before you know it, I realize I'm probably slower than I need to be. Why? Because we have air over here. Yep. Airway tone. But then I hit the wake turbulence in the airplane rolls And I've been 100 feet above the ground in F4 many, many times, all at 500 or plus knots. Mm -hmm. Most of the right side. Yeah, and never with the gear down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and here I am staring at the chevrons of the overrun, and my body, and I don't know if anybody's had a near-death experience, uh, hopefully not in an airplane, there's something when your body, when your mind is convinced you're gonna die, there is a, a trigger that fires and, and does a ram jump into your ready memory. And I told her uh, years later when I told her about this incident, I didn't hear about it this. would take me two hours for me to tell you all the things that I thought about in those two seconds. <laughs> and to this day, I don't know who put the airplane in full AD on both engines. I'm not really sure who rolled, continued rolling and got the airplane level and climbed out. But uh, when I landed, our taxi man ground gives me a call and says, the soft wants to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so I called him from the 82nd Coast Squadron right? near Tyndall. And he said, what the hell kind of air show are you putting <laughs> <laughs> And I said, can you assure you? After I changed my flight suit, not, not intentional by any means, and that, that that's when I became a believer in, in AOA. I mean, I was using it quite a bit anyway, but uh, that's when I realized that you're often in a position where you either don't have time to look down, uh, you, your head needs to be out, outside, and uh, I think all the time I was an instructor at Lyft at Holloman, and it was so hard for me to 
You know, I wish I had a little thing I could mount on the student's chest mm -hmm. that would do a chin, a chin plump. So get your head up, you know, get outside the airplane. Because when they're a pilot training, the instructors there are drilling into them to look inside yeah. the airplane. Now we bring them to teach them how to be fighter pilots, and so now we can't get them to look outside again. Yeah. And it's, uh, it, it's just, to me, a no-brainer when Cecil first brought this up you know, for an F-4 guy to have all of that information essentially with your eyes closed. Mm -hmm. You know, you could literally fly as a Somebody, somebody actually asked me that the other day. They go, that just kind of works with your eyes closed. They go, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, it's, it's really interesting because we, we actually even have a name for it in our program. We call it Grain Eggs and Ham Syndrome uh, because I do a lot of these presentations. I show a lot of videos and people still scratch their heads and they go, it can't be that simple, what? right? <laughs> well, it can't be that simple or that tone's out all the time. Yeah. It's, it's one of those two reactions. And then it's like, well, yeah, it's you got to try it. It's like green eggs and ham. It's, it's really hard. I thought when we first started this, if we built a system, I made a video and I showed it to everybody, they just get it. Because all I had to do was show the video. But it didn't work that way in real life. No, no it was really interesting that first year up at Oshkosh. There you go. So that's our salvage brief. Thank you so much for finding something that we could look at. Great discussion. It's probably lunchtime, huh? You got all the time. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a few of us, I think, that are going to do a post-flight lunch. If you want to join at what we decided.